I'm the Ground Aviation Bureau Director for the Agency of Transportation. Um, so what we're doing, just to give you a quick little history on why we're holding these meetings, um, the agency is required to do a statewide system aviation plan. Uh, it's part of an FAA requirement. Our last one was done in 2007, so we're due for one. Uh, and essentially what we do is we look at, uh, and Costa Pappas, who I'm going to hand it over to in a moment, uh, is going to get really in depth on the plan. Uh, but a little quick overview is we, um, we essentially look at our airports, our entire system of airports in the state, and where we are now, how are they working, and exactly what we want them to be. Because uh, it's essentially it's a 10 year plan, and we look out 10 and 20 years. Um, so we're really looking forward, uh, forward thinking on our, our airfields. Um, we do have a consultant engineer um, that is helping us write this plan, Ronald Johnson. So um, some of the information that we got tonight. We will be handing over to Farmer Johnson, uh, and they will be uh, putting ads to it, and we're going to essentially create a full plan. Uh, so that's a quick overview uh, of why we're here. Uh, I want to thank you everybody for coming. Hopefully you signed in. There's a sign-in sheet over here. If you haven't signed in, please do so. Uh, so right now I'm going to kick it over to Michelle Blumhauer. She's uh, our Director of Policy Planning and Intermodal Development at the Trans. She's going to talk to you a little bit about the economic development piece of this plan. Thanks, Dan. Um, before I move on to that piece, um, maybe what we can do is um, some introductions around so we know who's here and who's uh, interested in aviation. As Dan mentioned, um, I'm Michelle Boomhauer, and I work directly for Secretary of Transportation Joe Flynn. And um, Secretary Flynn has been to the Bennington Airport a number of times uh, in the past. Uh, summer essentially and um, he's very excited about the opportunity for us to get out and have these community discussions about the state airports and the system itself and so <clears throat> on behalf of him uh, I'm pleased that so many folks have come out this evening. Um, I uh, work in addition to oversight for the, um, the modes, uh, aviation, rail, public transit, um, I also oversee the policy planning, uh, mapping, uh, permitting side of things at the agency. And I spend a lot of my time in the legislature uh, each session working with your delegation, uh, working closely with folks interested in transportation to see how we can continue to improve transportation. So um, it's great to sort of get around the state and have this direct dialogue. Um, so we'll go around and just do self-introductions. Um, our the rest of our team is here, so we'll start with Chris. I'm Chris Beitzel. I work for the Rail Aviation Bureau. I'm the airport operations manager, and Bennington is one of the airports that I oversee. I'm Costa Pappas. I work in the planning section of E-Trans. I'm Paul Libby. I'm a senior project manager. All the construction projects that happen on airports uh, come through my shop. And if you just want to say your name or you can pass and, and um, what your interest might be in aviation. I'm Tom Kinney. I live in the neighborhood of the airport. Okay. Uh, my name's Robin Outwater and I uh, used to work at the airport. Uh, David Corey. I own some property out there. Dave Anderson. I have a hanger out there. Dan Walton. I've been involved in the airport off and on. I'm just curious to see what they're up to for a long term plan. Uh, way back here. Nothing. Just up to our right. Thanks. Mark Anders, I'm a planner with the Regional Planning Commission. Okay. Uh, Christopher Wright, I'm with the Civil Air Patrol and we have a squadron at the airport in Bennington. Wonderful. And, sir? Um, the, uh, Jim Theory with uh, Vermont Digger. Okay, Jim, thanks for coming. Blake Mirabel, president of the EIA Chapter 1375 and also a member of Civil Air Patrol. We have two more members coming in here. Excellent, that's great. Um, so it's really nice to see such a variety of users here and, and owners from the airport um, that have interests. Um, we're going to be um, talking a bit in the planning process about um, the economic development side of aviation. Um, there was a significant push at the legislature this past session uh, and <coughs> the um, Economic Development Commerce Committee uh, which Representative Bazzo has chaired historically, um, 
push through legislation asking the Agency of Commerce and the Agency of Transportation to collaborate on looking at ways to enhance economic development uh, activities and services at state airports and for the aviation uh, um, community in general. And so um, Secretary Sherling has a memo which was part of the handouts that uh, are at the table there. Um, they are going to be focusing in the comprehensive economic development plan for the state on integrating more communication related to aviation economic development. They work closely with the Vermont Chamber of Commerce and Chris Kerrigan, who's with the chamber, many of you may know, he works uh, extensively with the aerospace and aviation community uh, industries to bring um, more commerce to the state from our partners in Canada to the north as well as uh, greater New England area. And so um, that combined with uh, efforts in this update of the state marketing plan will dovetail with what we are collecting in the aviation systems plan. Um, <clears throat> and I think that um, we want to hear all of your ideas tonight. I think everybody um, understands the reality, particularly if you've been involved with the airport here in the area for a long time, about the um, time it takes to bring resources to developing the airport and growing the airport. And Dave and, and other leaders here in the community have done a great job of keeping um, the drum beating, and we really appreciate that. And I think we're in a really good position, and Cost is going to talk a little bit about this with the rec recent um, authorization bill for aviation that uh, came out of Congress. And, and so, in terms of our ability to invest in um, the airports through our federal resources, I think we're going to be in, in good shape. State resources continue to be um, very tight for us across the agency, um, not for just aviation, but for all modes, including highways. We always have more requests for um, investment than we have the ability to uh, make investments for. Um, on, a, on a sort of global perspective, our state highway system is about 63% um, funded in terms of what it should be to maintain just a basic state of good repair. And you probably all experience that in certain roads and bridges that you cross every day. So um, that's a bit of a higher level perspective. Um, and so while, um, while we ask you to sort of shoot for the moon in terms of communicating to us what you're interested in and what you'd like to see going forward into the future, um, we'll also be balancing that with the reality of, of how we can um, invest resources across the 10 state airports that we have uh, to manage. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Costa, and Costa's going to lead us through the presentation. I'm going to be taking notes for the evening so that we um, will have a record of interests, questions, et cetera. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in tonight's meeting. So I'm going to give you an overview of the aviation uh, system plan, uh, why, why we're doing it, where we are in the process. The one thing, when we put plans like this together, because we are talking about a long range 10 to 20 year plan, we, we like to get out and get comment early before we start um, you know, really dwelling into policy matters. Because a lot of this stuff, whether it's economic development or um, you know, land use, all the things that affect airports, it, it's important to get that input early on um, so we're not constantly revising um, documents that are prepared for this project. So. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Uh, so, uh, as I noted, this is a, a really long-range plan. You know, we are looking 20 years out, and we're looking specific at the public use airports. Uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, but there are about 100 airports total in Vermont. Uh, 16 of them are public use airports. Uh, 10 are owned by the state, uh, including the airport here in Bennington. Uh, there's one municipal airport in Burlington. Um, and the other five are privately owned, uh, kind of scattered throughout the state. Although they're private, they're open to the public, uh, and as a result, they're part of this plan. So in terms of why we're doing this, uh, Dan talked earlier about the, the requirement by the Federal Aviation Administration to have a current plan, um, and this makes us, as a state, eligible for certain types of funding. 
So if you think of, uh, of a lot of the major projects that, that occur, whether it's, you know, redoing runways or, um, you know, aprons, a lot of this infrastructure is paid primarily by federal funds, uh, generally 90%, 90% federal and 10% state. So the federal government has uh, a large interest in this since they're generally financing 90% of the improvements. And as a result, they periodically want us to develop plans. Now, as a system plan, so this is really clear, we aren't doing individual airport plans here. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration is interested in how all 16 of the public use airports in the state work together. So th this is at a state level. Uh, typically, when, when planning gets to an airport, uh, you're dealing with what's called a master plan or a layout plan, which really details the nuts and bolts of what's being proposed in terms of infrastructure. Uh, and the plan being over 10 years old, it's actually approaching 12 years now, 2007. Uh, when a plan is that old, you know, we really need to look at whether, you know, its contents reflect the needs of today. Uh, and if not, you know, what do we do to, to change them, including the priorities? So in terms of how these plans are developed, the, again, the Federal Aviation Administration has a prescribed format for what we're supposed to be looking at, uh, evaluating the accuracy and performance of the airports, you know, how are they performing um, in terms of aviation movements, in terms of the facilities and services that are available, um, developing a vision, what do we want our airports to look like? Thinking again out a 20 year period, what, what do they need? What, what are the infrastructure needs? What are the service needs that are out there? Uh, and then finally developing goals and recommendations to support, you know, you know whatever those needs um, are. And how we do that, we use three primary vehicles. One is that there's a, uh, a governor appointed uh, aviation Advisory Council that advises the agency on uh, aviation policy. Uh, we also reach out to fixed base operators, which are the folks that uh, manage the day-to-day -day operations of a lot of the airports, uh, as well as stakeholders, and that includes businesses on the airfields, the military, you know, there's a lot of different stakeholders. And of course, the general public, um, you know, that live around the airfields, uh, those are the three primary kind of mechanisms we use to get feedback. So it's very important for us to hear your thoughts because that, you know, when we're assessing how we put these plans together, you know, we compile all of these comments and all the notes that we take uh, and we try to view everything from those lenses. So uh, very important. There are comment forms out front. Um, you know, feel free to take some back with you if you know people that are interested in this issue. Uh, they can complete them. Pastor, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure that people realize if you leave us an email address on the sign-in sheet, we will add you to our stakeholder notification um, yep. list so that throughout this process you'll continue to get information as it becomes available and new posts to our website for the plan. Yeah, that's a really good point. Go ahead. So some of the changes since 2007, uh, there's been quite a number of them. Um, federal aviation policies and funding in particular. Michelle spoke earlier about um, a five-year federal spending bill for aviation, an authorization. Uh, for those of you that follow the aviation world at a federal level, uh, it, it tends to be uh, quite interesting in that, you know, we can go a long time without having a long-term funding bill um, and then you know out of nowhere we ended up with what's a really good one in terms of its length you know covering five years that ensures you know adequate capital funding over several years uh, and, and it removes some of the uncertainties uh, like we've dealt with in the past where the bills have been year to year. Um, new requirements on planning by the FAA um, Aviation technology, you know, think where we were a decade ago with um, issues like drones or, you know, the, um, the actual operational and mechanics of aircraft. 
they've changed quite a bit over the last 12 years. So that's another um, you know, line of thinking that, that needs to change with, with this current iteration. And we've also, we're in the process of updating the overall state transportation uh, plan. Uh, and again, that's gonna feed into the aviation plan and vice versa. Okay, um, so earlier I talked generally about how we put these plans together. Uh, and again, this emphasizes that we're really early. Uh, at this stage, we've been collecting a lot of data that's required uh, by the federal planning rules in terms of how uh, airports operate and how they perform. Um, we're, we're getting in slowly into a phase where we're gonna be looking at future forecasting uh, as well as measuring performance. That's what I call more the technical uh, aspect of this plan. Uh, the policy component is still to come, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little more detail to give you an idea of what kind of issues we've been hearing about that we're gonna attempt to, to address as part of this plan. Okay, and again, you heard earlier about the marketing of state airports. So this is a separate piece of legislation uh, that was introduced this year that requires a couple of things. First off, uh, it does require the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to update the state's economic development and marketing plan to include the marketing of state-owned airports. So those um, 10 airports that you saw on the map earlier uh, colored in, they're, they're colored in purple on the maps that you have uh, that's the scope of what the legislature uh, wants covered. Um, and as part of that, for the marketing component anyway, they have to consider the plan that we're working on as part of the report to the legislature uh, and also address economic development opportunities that really uh, target you know, the commercialization of next generation aviation technologies. Uh, along with that, um, they're also required to examine the feasibility of electric charging stations for both vehicles and aircraft, uh, along with um, renewable, renewable energy options at the airports as well. So that's, you know, not, I'm trying to keep this as simple by kind of segmenting them. So we have the state AV, uh, airport system plan on the one hand, then there's this uh, H620 legislative report they're, they're very critical to one another. Yep. Okay, uh, so in terms of airports in general, I, I, I stated earlier that there's approximately 100 of them. Uh, the majority are private use airports, airfields, strips, you know, they go by different names. Um, there's 20 heliports and five seaplane uh, sea bases. What we're focused on for the purpose of the airport system plan are the 16 public use airports. And um, another, to add a third piece to the, the airport plan, the, the marketing study, we're also going to be updating an old 2003 uh, economic impact study of the state's public use airports. There was a study done back in 2003 that quantified um, the direct, indirect, and induced jobs impact um, and wages, and also documented what sectors were, um, you know, were represented on airport business. So, so, you know, they were looking at the different service sectors, you know, manufacturing. So that study is going to be updated to see, you know, where we are in um, 2018 as compared to where we were back in 2003. So in terms of uh, the airport um, located here in town, uh, I think a lot of people have seen these images if you've been following the news. Uh, recent improvements included a full reconstruction of the runway. Uh, the addition of a partial parallel taxiway and improved uh, safety areas, which uh, consisted of leveling the slopes um, to ensure that a security buffer um, was extended. Um, and in terms of the needs we've heard about, and, and again, you know, that we're really early in the process of, don't be surprised if this is not an all-encompassing list, but uh, resurfacing the apron areas and also upgrading the fuel farm 
uh, are just a couple that we've, we've heard about in terms of need. Bennington's still a category one airport, is that correct? It's a category, we, we, we haven't gotten to that part yet, but I, uh, yeah, 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 let's, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a couple of uh, minutes. Just a few statistics overall on um, airport operations. So I don't know if that's really clear uh, or not over there, but generally the vast majority, well over 80% of all the airport operations at the 16 public use airports um, are general aviation. <laughs> You know, you can look at the statistics. Burlington, obviously, with air carriers. Um, some airports have significant military operations. But in terms of the 16 collectively, um, about 80% are general aviation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the runway lengths um, for each of the airports over here. So I think you were talking about the length of the runway, uh, 3,700 feet. Um, you know, again, they vary. Uh, the longest, for, for obvious reasons, is out in Burlington. And, um, and we'll talk in just in a couple minutes about the, the relationship between the runway lengths and, you know, what's being proposed in the handout that you're looking at. So, uh, based aircraft, <clears throat> um, single engine planes, uh, over 90% of all the aircraft that are based at the 16 uh, airports, you can see them tallied there by individual airport. Uh, there's 23 out of 25 here are single engine aircraft. Okay, so airport categories, and this is getting to your question, sir. Um, so the, the airports, there's different classification systems that are used uh, to define airports for the purposes of a statewide study. Uh, if you're doing, if you're working on an airport master plan, this doesn't have a lot of meaning. But again, going back uh, to the FAA and how they look at airports as a system, uh, we've had our consultant define airport categories based on a lot of FAA categorization of airports. It gets much more complicated if you're in a very large state with huge airports, you know, it branches out to 10 or 15 different levels. At a simplistic level, um, you know, these categories are set up to account for the level of facilities and services that are offered. So when you look at category one airports, um, they provide a very basic uh, level of facilities. Um, as you go to, Category two, then you're dealing with airports that have more, you know, established facilities like weather systems or can, can accommodate different aircraft. Uh, category three airports tend to be, um, you know, more regional gateway airports, again, tied to their, their facilities and the services they offer. Uh, and category four airports uh, tend to be focused on passenger services. So there you're looking at Burlington uh, and Rutland. You know, they have uh, passenger facility needs that are different from, from general aviation airports. C can we go back one more? So your, so your question on what category the airport here in Bennington, um, based on these definitions, you know, it, it's a category three airport. It's, and again, Matt, it's on facilities, not the kind of airport airplanes that this airport would serve, which is right. what Right, there's a uh, category one airports, uh, primary runway length is 2,500 paved or turf. Category two is 4,000 feet, greater than or equal than 4,000 feet paved. We only have 37. Yeah, and, and we'll, again, we'll talk, those are proposed service standards. They're not what's there right now. Okay. You know, but, but generally the idea here is that the airports, you know, meet one of these categories for classification purposes and based on the service, you know, what's there now uh, and what potentially could be there, it, it was classified as a category three airport. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so this is, the, 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 this deals with your question specifically um, and, and uh, 
basically what you're seeing here is for each of the categories, this is our consultant's recommendation on what the minimum and the recommended service level should be at these airports. So um, if you look at what's included in these category one in terms of runway lengths and services, that's not what's out there now. You know, but that's what, what should be there under this recommended approach that they've come up with. In other words, for category one airports, and remember these are the airports with minimal services, uh, what's stated here is the primary runway length uh, should be equal to or over 2,500 feet. You know, that, that would be a minimum. Um, the recommendation would be 4,000 feet. And it's the same idea if you go over, Chris, thank you, one more. Same idea for category two airports, the minimum should be 4,000 or greater. The recommendation is 5,000 feet. Yep, let's go through them quickly. Okay, uh, so category three airports, again, let's get rid of that thing. 5,000 foot minimum. And I'm just focused on the runway lengths now because that, 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 that deals with your question, but uh, it's the same idea with services. You know, as you climb the categories, uh, the, the, fi the fixed based operator or the operations management services increase accordingly. Uh, what, the, the last one, um, category four, because these are passenger airports, they don't have, um, you know, detailed recommendations on facilities uh, and, and services because they're required to provide them. And they're all very different. A lot of this has to do with what the individual airport's priorities are rather than, um, you know, a minimum recommended. So does that, does that make sense in terms of... Does it meet the definitions according to the blue chart here? Yeah, it, it's not... So, if it met the definitions, we, we probably wouldn't be here is, is the point. It's, you know, they're looking at the airport's in terms of, you know, are, are, are these regional gateways? So is the airport in Bennington a regional gateway? If the answer is yes, then according, you know, to what they're recommending to us, it should meet what's in there. It should be a category three? No, it should meet what the category three requirements are. In other words, the runway should be longer. Right, and there 5, should feet, greater than equal to 5,000 feet. Yeah. So, so I guess my question is, we just got done rebuilding the runway and the taxiway. Uh, and it's 3,700 feet long. Yeah. Uh, if even for category uh, one, it's suggested to go to 4,000 feet, why don't we just extend it 300 feet? Yeah. So the 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 remember again, we're talking about what we think is going to happen over a 20-year period here, right? So and and Dan can explain this a little better than than I can. But the basic idea here is that the FAA will allow you to extend runways to the point where you're meeting the current demand for aviation operations and not what we think is going to happen 20 years from now. So that's how you're granted, yeah, you can feel yeah, free. Okay. So just essentially what he just said, but a little more detail. Um, so the FAA basically will fund things uh, based on your current use. They do, FAA will not sort of, if you build it, they will come. They won't fund that um, kind of project. So when we looked at this runway and the length of it, it's meeting the current critical aircraft that's landing there. If you had a critical aircraft that was landing there today that was bigger than the current runway that you have, then they would allow us to spend federal money on extending the runway. We don't have that right now. Our current critical aircraft can land on the length that we have currently. The larger aircraft can't land on the runway as it is so you don't know. I mean, they're just preventing right. so, from landing there. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the argument that we make to the FAA, and they don't really buy it, because that's what every airport in the whole country will say. Well, if, if, I, if you allow me to build it, then they can land, right? Uh, but that's not the No, no. They can't land now. They can't. I, I get they your, are I get your, not allowed to do it. Certain size jets have to have a minimum of 4,000 right. feet. It, it Correct. would be For illegal sure. to... Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, it's it's a chicken and the egg problem, right? It's which one, right? Which one to come first? But so the FAA's spent, theory is they won't fund that. So we just spent several million dollars on rebuilding the runway. Why didn't we just extend it 300 feet? It seemed like a logical solution. 
to bring in bigger airplanes. It seems like the goal is to bring in bigger airplanes. <coughs> the cost would have been a lot more. To right. Yeah. So, so if you look at what we did and where we filled on um, one end of the airport, we would have had to go quite a bit further, and the cost of that would have been significantly different than what we paid for. And FAA wouldn't pay for it. And FAA won't pay for that. And, yeah. Yeah. If, and, and that's not the only one. I mean, you saw from the, the chart earlier that there's a lot of runways that have these odd numbers, you know, 3,700, 30, you know, 2,800, you know, so it, it, it's, a, it's a problem because, you know, when, when you look at the aircraft requirements in terms of runway lengths, they don't correspond to what a federal agency will necessarily fund. Uh, and it, it puts us in quite a predicament when it comes to undertaking these projects. All right, so let's keep going. Okay, so what's, uh, what's next? Um, again, going back to my earlier statement about we're really early in the process, uh, what we're gonna do you know, after we go through the data collection process is um, come up with forecasts, you know, so again, to your question, sir, uh, you know, what, what's the likely future uh, in terms of what aircraft and what kind of aircraft operations on these airfields, you know, what's a reasonable growth scenario for the airports? Uh, what types of facilities and services will airports, you know, require to meet these category requirements? Um, as you saw from the chart earlier, it's primarily runway length and it's primarily the, the services that are offered at, at the airports. Um, and how do we come up with the recommendations and strategies to get to that, you know, that ultimate plan? Then we have uh, what I call a major core of the plan, which is the policy issues that, you know, we're going to be dealing with um, as part of this, um, this project. So, you know, we've already heard um, from folks on issues that, you know, they view as important since we're putting a 20-year plan together. I'm going to run through them quickly. I won't talk about these uh, in detail, but um, how do we integrate trans uh, aviation with other transportation modes? And this isn't just passenger services. Uh, it's also freight. You know, some of our airports are used to, to deliver freight. Uh, that are time sensitive. You know, think of two day shipping, think of next day shipping. Uh, back in 2007, did that really exist? You know, in terms of, you know, every major um, real estate establishment essentially guaranteeing these shipping times. Um, very important issue moving forward. Uh, the relationship between, you know, surrounding communities and airports, uh, whether it's encroachment, <coughs> to the airports or encroachment on the community. You know, remember there's two sides uh, to look at this. One of the major questions that we get asked uh, from local governments is, you know, how can we support our local airport? Well, one of the big ones is the, um, uh, the, um, the diagram that you're seeing up there. So what this shows in the middle is a runway uh, and then, you know, the takeoff zone and the, the landing airspace a lot of it crosses municipal boundaries. You know, just because an airport is contained in one municipality uh, doesn't mean the approach to that airport is limited to one municipality either. So when, you know, zoning codes are being updated or other regulations, that's something that's very important but because without those clearances, um, you know, it may not matter how long the runway is if you can't get to the runway. So that, that's another major um, issue that we're gonna be dealing with. Economic development, I think we've spoken enough about that to understand the significance of it, um, given the, the legislature's uh, interest in having, um, you know, the, the airports, the state airports marketed. Let's go. Uh, financial sustainability, you know, so we talked earlier about generally 90% of the cost of air, airport infrastructure projects are federally financed. Um, the state has to maintain them afterward, right? So we don't have federal operations dollars that come along with that. So when, when runways get expanded, um, you, you know, when other facilities get built, you know, we have to maintain them afterwards and there's a cost of that. Private sector involvement also very big. We've been hearing a lot about 
interest in developing, you know, airfields or, or airports. And one of the issues that we're dealing with is the way the Federal Aviation Administration prioritizes the projects, you know, that they want to see. So basically, when we submit projects, they have their own prioritization method. Um, and, and sometimes that doesn't always dovetail with what, um, you know, private interest in developing airports is. So someone, you know, may have an interest in developing hangars. Uh, that's not something that would rank really high with the FAA at the moment. Right now they're focused on um, a lot of projects dealing with runways and approaches that are safety oriented. So, you know, what happens if there's an interest on a part of a developer to build a business on a, uh, at an airport or some sort of infrastructure and we can't necessarily get federal funding for it? That, that creates uh, an issue. And, you know, those of you that are involved in aviation, think of your own needs, whether you have a business on an airport or rely on a business on an airport. Um, sometimes you have ideas you know, that, that are great, and, and the federal funding may not follow that, and that, you know, that, that's a challenge. Uh, technology, we've already um, talked about. Yeah. Okay, in terms of the schedule, um, and I don't want to keep talking, I want your questions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up really quick here. So we think we're going to go towards the end of winter developing this plan. This is the first of nine public meetings that, that, that we have, and we have meetings lined up, um, you know, everywhere where we have, you know, most places where we have a state-owned airport. We're also meeting with fixed-based operators, uh, and, and, you know, the Aviation Council is, is a body that we report to on a quarterly basis. Um, the, the policy section is clearly going to be one that we're going to spend a lot of time on. Um, and when we have a draft, again, to Michelle's point about being, being very important uh, to include an email so we can include you on the distribution list, there'll be multiple review opportunities for the plan as it's being developed. Basically, we haven't developed much, which is what we want. Uh, we want to hear your thoughts before we start drafting plans. And I think that's it. So. Um, Paul, Libby, and myself, if you have any questions that you think of afterwards or you want to submit some comments, um, there's, there's comment forms up front or feel free to call me or shoot me an email. Uh, if you want to discuss anything, we'd be happy to, to take your calls and emails. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for questions because typically when we go out to these meetings, we get a lot of them. Um, so. Any comments or questions? Sir? Uh, the audience is kind of small. Uh, where was it posted in Bennington for folks to see? So uh, we sent a notice to the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, we, also, yeah, we also sent, uh, I, we also put a, an ad in the uh, Bennington banner. And then the Bennington banner also did a story um, on this meeting, correct, Mark? Yeah, so we, we advertise in all the local papers and we try to get the word out through the regional planning commissions and then if local papers pick up the story even better, it, it gives a lot more exposure. Sir? There was a flying at the airport over the weekend and there was no information. I didn't find out about this till 15 minutes before the meeting. I would think that would have been a pregnant time to reach out to people that are in the aviation community is right there at the airport when there's a flight. Yeah, yeah, so the question I had too, to piggyback on that, is I, I couldn't find out about this at the airport. I actually told them what was going on. Yeah, so the other thing we did, we also sent this notice, uh, we have a big distribution list of all uh, the folks that participate in the Aviation Council and everyone that's ever attended, including, you know, the, the fixed-based operators. So we, we try to, you know, we blasted this everywhere we can think of, but you bring up a, a good point that um, you want to get the key players that are exactly. part of the airport to get on it. The other thing is, why are you having an airport meeting in fire us? And we've got an airport. Why we're having a meeting at the firehouse? Why don't we have it at the airport so that the public, that probably half this town doesn't know right. where or what right. we have an airport. Right. Get them involved. 
Yeah, so, so with, Good point. you know, clearly with public meetings, you know, having them at airports, there's, you know, there's, there's security concerns, right? We, we, it's not a controlled, we know it's, not, it's not a controlled environment. We got the National Guard to yeah. be security. <laughs> the National Guard, yeah, I, I mean, you know, there's also, you know, it's a public meeting, right? So we yeah. want people. It's a public airport. It's a public airport. And we had a lot of space upstairs in the airport. We could set up. Was this on the Vermont Aviation website? The state website? Yeah, they're all so, on the aviation. I mean, website. I asked Rob about it the other day, and he didn't know anything about it. He's been involved with it, so. Hmm. Yeah, we published all the, the, they're all posted on the website. <clears throat> So if you're, con if you're concerned that there's folks out there that want to give us comments that don't know about it and you think they want to know about it, we have I'm some sheets. So we have sheets here. If you can, you know, there's certainly bring them to whoever you think might want to make comments. We want the comments. Right. We absolutely want your comments. That's why we're here. That approach, <clears throat> forgive me, isn't that a bit after the fact? Uh, couldn't you go to the FAA and get a list of all pilots in Vermont, Bennington County, within a certain geographic area, and isn't that the audience you want to reach out to? We, we want everybody, not just pilots. We want everybody but, in the veterinary. Area. We want, but we certainly want pilots are stakeholders from the get-go, as well as the local yep. community. Have you gone to the FAA to get their no. stuff? Yeah. No. Is that something that you think you might want to consider? We probably won't do that. We're going to do it just like we're doing it. We're going to publish it in papers, websites. And Doesn't that limit your audience? I live in the I live I live in the national parks. I don't get a newspaper. I do have email. I participated in the meetings. I, I didn't get an email about. The, am I the only one? Because oh. all right. I mean, I'm suggesting politely, taking out the lunch uh, <laughs> that that you're not turning over all the stones. That I think that if you're a pilot and you live here, you'd be you'd want to. We'll, we'll, we'll take that comment. With, all, have, with all due respect. We have eight more meetings and uh, we'll think about Contact that. the FAA. I thought those eight meetings going to be here in Bennington. No. Yeah, I, I strongly but urge you to contact. You, this is, we're at the beginning of this process, guys. This is, if you have comments, we're not done this tonight. This is going to go on for a while. Doing anything new provides mm -hmm. monumental opportunities to make mistakes and equal number of opportunities to learn. I suggest that you contact the FAA get all pilots with current medical certificate. Yep. They want to be here. Yeah, thank you for your comment. We're definitely going to evaluate means to contact to encourage effective nation. Right. One more short sure. reminder is that was it were you required to post this a certain way by the state? Well we I mean we public meetings of this sort always get posted. So, so yeah, what was the criteria for that? Was it so many days in advance in certain places? Well, I know so our local meetings are so many days in advance in certain places, yeah. visible to the public. Yeah, we, I mean, we want to make sure there's enough time for people to see it, you know, you know, and not put it, you know, way too early and they forget about it. We don't have an actual, you know, requirement. We, we, you know, we try to get them in, you know, seven to 14 days before. Just to clarify, the, the public meeting law um, requirements for public bodies is different than um, coming out to gain in, in input and interest. And um, I think we definitely are hearing you that there are more means and measures that we could take. Um, what we'd really love to hear is what do you want to see at your airport? Um, you know, what's missing, what's not working, what could we do more of, what could we do less of. Um, so, you know, um, maybe there's other ideas we can uh, move on to, because I think we definitely are hearing you about how you heard about or didn't hear about the meeting, and, and we will work on that. Thanks for your comment. Not to be a dead horse, but there's the stakeholders at the airport that that pay rent and various things to the, the state of Vermont. I'm sure you must have a list of all of those people in, in the transportation department, aviation. You might want to include that group just as a courtesy, I would think. Yeah, so, and, and we're meeting with all the fixed based operators, and you know, at several of the meetings that we've had already, um, 
in terms of the Aviation Council, we've let them know ahead of time, you know, to, to really reflect, you know, their, their operating needs, but also the needs of the businesses on the airfield, on the, uh, at the airports, and we'll be doing a lot more of that. Good point. I would be Civil Air Patrol here in Bennington. I'm the Aerospace Education Officer. I've been trying to push aerospace education as part of Civil Air Patrol and also on my own. Yeah. What support can the state lend to that effort? Because um, look around the room here. See a lot of young people? No. Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> generation of pilots, aircraft owners, mechanics, people who are going to work at and around the airports, they have to come from someplace. What kind of support for aviation and aerospace education can be built into the airport system plan? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good point. And I don't, Dan, do we have any, do we participate in any initiatives towards that goal? So, this is something that um, has been brought up at um, Aviation Council as well. And I think nationwide, we're experiencing the same thing. The, the age of a, you know average pilot is, is growing and uh, not a lot of new people coming in. Um, <clears throat> I was at the FAA office in Burlington, Mass. about three weeks ago, met with their education person down there. And I said, what are all the other states in New England doing? And um, essentially nothing is what's happening right now. Does that represent an opportunity for Vermont to yeah. leadership? Yeah, and so, and so that was one of the things um, that um, I said, exactly what, what I said. So uh, we do have um, a person on our staff, actually he's a temporary employee, but he's at the Caledonia Airport. He does all, he is responding, do you know Chris Raymond? Have you heard of Chris Raymond? Yes, I do. I've worked with Chris. So what we're going to try to do is work with Chris on expanding what his duties are a little bit um, to push the word out, expand the education piece. We're also working on, and this is not in the plan, this is something totally separate. We're off track a little bit, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, we're developing, and this was something, I, I asked this specific question. I said, "What are, sta are states paying for anything for airports, and are they doing anything? As no, all the, uh, anything that they're doing right now in support of education is, if the state owns an airport, they'll say, okay, you can use our space for your program. You create the program, you run it, you do it all, we'll give you a the office for a couple hours or whatever it is, that type of thing. So, in the past, um, apparently, and I've only been in this for about a year, so I've, I've asked the question, historically, what have we done at VTrans? And apparently we've offered um, some expense for fuel, some, some reimbursement for fuel when you guys have fly-ins and things like that, take, up some, take the kids up, give them a free ride, whatever. So we're developing in-house, uh, and it's not there yet, but we're developing, um, there's going to be an application on our website. If your group has a fly-in and you want to, you know, you get five or ten of your buddies and they'll, they're willing to fly kids at a camp, um, you can apply for some money for reimbursement of fuel. So we're working on that. We agree with you. Without you guys, without new pilots, our airports are going to die. Well, without dragging this too far into the weeds, uh, would it be possible for me to get in touch with someone? Because Chris Raymond is stretched beyond the breaking point, and getting to his duties is probably not going to help. I'm trying to work on a more formal program with the schools here in Maine. What state support can we get for that? Can I get at least get B trans to help with any proposals that I try and get in front of the legislature? So as part of this program that I'm trying to develop, some of it might be financial, like we give you reimbursement for fuel. Some of it might be, I have a program, I just need help with this, whatever it is. I need a, help writing a, a grant or help writing a policy or help writing something. Um, I don't even know, like, okay, so you've got your idea and we have eight other meetings like this and there's probably going to be one or two people in the audience to say, I've got this idea and I want to get kids into it. I don't know what all your ideas are. So I'm trying to develop a program that we can help you. 
you might want to uh, get in touch with the uh, vocational education department in the state of Vermont, uh, the regional centers around the state, and it would seem like a natural uh, marriage there between you know airport areas and vocational centers to try to develop. Because in aviation right now, I was talking with a uh, a commercial pilot that he's in charge of 200 corporate aircraft out of the Boston area, and he said they are crying for pilots. And he said that he was uh, a little apprehensive to approach his boss about this year's uh, budgets because he felt that we would have to pay a considerable amount more to the pilots already on board to keep them because of the escalating wages with the, with the volume or, or the vacuum of, of upcoming pilots to fill the slots. So there's a tremendous need there and, and certainly in the near future. And we're definitely hearing that everywhere we go. Here's the fine line we, 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 we walk every day. We're V-trains. We are essentially the owners of the infrastructure. We maintain it. We go through the FAA. We get federal funds to maintain the infrastructure. How far do we go to, like we, we essentially, we have FBOs that run airports. We try not to run airports. Um, it's like, we're the, I hate to compare it to the highways, but you know, we don't run the businesses all along the highway, right? But we maintain the infrastructure. Is part of your charge to facilitate new uh, programs and ideas that, that might? Uh, it is, but I, I don't want to give you I don't want to give you false hope that we're actually going to run all these programs that you guys. What it would be great is if we assisted folks like you guys and help you get it off the ground so you run it. Sure, we're not asking you to run. Not yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, we're probably not going to go that far, but if we can do something to help you get something off the ground, we're that's. You know, so, yeah, so, so just to answer the gentleman's question, right? So you identified the need in your action plan for where? For, what do you? What's your suggestion on what we can do to help? Uh, it's, it would be very helpful by talking to the schools to be able to say, all right, look, this isn't just me, private citizen, wanting to do this. Yeah. We've got support from VTrans and the state, and if you guys are willing to put V-trains behind any efforts that we want to put in front of the legislature to toss some extra funding into the education pool for aviation and aerospace. In other words, have the agency standing behind the so it's easy, it's, infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's, I'd have to see the plan, but it's, it's fairly easy for us to support you and say we're going to help you get this. We talked about it early. State state funds are hard to come by, right? Mm -hmm. So, is there a little bit about of money that helps? You know, we maybe we can do something. But if it's funding a big program for education, <laughs> that'll be tough. That's the honest answer. I, I think I would just add, just because I spent a lot of time in the legislature and working with the agency of commerce, that hearing this kind of feedback is important because these are elements that the agency of commerce also wants to help with in trying to better understand how we're going to grow this industry which needs young people to be growing up in it um, in this state and so um, while, while we may not be the, the key link to solving it we can connect the resources so i think and, and like you said we can amplify and support the messaging so we whether it's and i think this will be sort of a framework that has to be incorporated into the plan in terms of um, education and um, the next generation and um, a, sort of separate from the plan itself let's figure out what what ideas you have and, and how we can work together to make those happen well given that it's also part of your mandate when your uh, was that house bill there h620 620 yep. for marketing the airports yep that's commerce yeah, yeah we'll be working so, with Commerce on that. Yeah, I think all of this can fit together into one good overarching program. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. So, and feel free to be, get in touch. The, this distinction between state agencies to, you know, contact us. Contact, you know, we, we talk to one another. We, we're not too detached. So I just, I just yeah. like to point out that there are two groups at the airport already that fly kids. Uh, and that is the, the EAA, uh, Experimental Aircraft Association, 
the Sport Flying Club uh, specifically, and the Civil Air Patrol. And I've flown kids uh, in, under both groups. So the EAA, we have the Young Eagles program, and certain times of the year we put together a, a free rides for kids as long as their mothers or parents sign a waiver. And uh, under the uh, Civil Air Patrol, we take up cadets, and those can be as young as 13 years old. So that's those two groups existing already, and if money's available for fuel, we'd like to tap into that. How many do you typically? Well, if we do uh, experimental aircraft association, we might fly 20 kids in one day um, with four, three or four airplanes. And you typically do that how many times a year? We might do that once a year. Okay. Not every year, but in the past we've flown over 20 kids in one day. And that's great. We reach out to the local schools. And we also have, through both of those organizations, have given tours to younger elementary kids. So getting them out to the airport is, is part of that outreach. And uh, I've been involved in both of those kinds of things. Uh, so I just want to point that out. That there are two existing organizations that are reaching out to the newer, younger generation. I think that's very important. Very good point. Uh, sir, then we'll come. I have an infrastructure question for you. OK. Uh, could you put up that slide that mentioned the charging stations for uh, vehicles and aircraft? Yeah, so that's the H620 slide. I think you want back past it. There we go. So I was excited to see that because I'm converting uh, one of my aircraft to electric. And um, one thing that we have been discussing at the airport is having a uh, electric aircraft technology showcase, all right, and inviting a lot of um, individual developers as well as company develop developers of aircraft. However, we don't have any charging stations. And I'm wondering, is this something that, the, that there's money from the federal government to put uh, at airports in Vermont? I, that's an I can answer that. So um, there is currently a Volkswagen Air Emissions Settlement Fund um, that recently just had a notification of the first round of funding for installing electric vehicle charging stations. And I wouldn't say it's for aircraft, <laughs> it's only for automobiles. Well, it um, could be the same system. Yes, you know, same system, you yeah. You could tap into it with the right connectors. Right. The, the goal of that program is to um, identify locations where there's going to be the highest density of users. So airports is probably not going to meet that criteria. Um, what we're trying to do is to, um, we also last year in, um, enabled legislation to do public-private partnerships. So we are hoping to, and we're working on our guidance um, documents right now for solicited and unsolicited P3s. And we hope to put out a unsolicited P3 notification um, and try to attract um, companies who do electric charging um, to co-locate um, you know, a charging station at um, some of our state-owned facilities, whether they be airports or park and rides or other locations where there might be an interest. I think um, they, you know, I don't know sort of what the electrification um, sort of charging rate is needed for electric aircraft um, and sort of the recharge periods, etc. I'm assuming it's probably the higher like level three and which is the fast charge systems. Um, depending on sort of what the duration is for your batteries and that sort of thing for electric aircraft. But um, I think we might have a hard time attracting level three installations because they do require phase three power uh, for those. And so we have that at some airports, we probably don't have it at other airports. So but phase, phase two is just like 220, right? Yeah. Single phase. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that can also service electric yeah. motorcycles and aircraft. Yeah. Light so there aircraft. Might, there not might be opportunities. Big yeah. commercial aircraft that don't exist yet. Right. But the light aircraft. Yeah. And um, we certainly have um, been contacted by uh, an organization who is developing what they believe will be the first um, commercial electric aircraft to be, be viable. They're, they're testing it in Burlington right now and um, hope to so, operationalize it. 
Plattsburgh. So is there any federal support for putting a charging station, say at the Bennington Airport, for cars? Not for cars. Um, not that I'm aware of in terms of, um, like I said, the sort of the existing resources we have are probably not going to be applicable to the airport just because there's not enough traffic there. But I, I think we might be, have other ways to do this. So I'd love to hear more about your thinking around the, the fly-in and um, the needs and, you know, how we might uh, work together to facilitate something. So, you know, offline, um, you'll, you'll have Costa's email address and uh, please send us that information because it ties right into this effort. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. One of the handouts is a letter from the Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development with his contact information for the very thing you're talking about. They, they want to hear, you know, the work you're doing and they want to hear your thoughts on, you know, how they can help. So please, you know, make sure if you haven't, take, you know, take one of those. And as a general rule, you got one, yeah. You, you know, just kind of a general comment, you know, we'd like to hear about all different types of innovative ideas. You know, the, the state airports are available, you know, so, this legislation deals specifically, it says it really clearly, next generation aeronautics technology. And yeah, that's exciting that it's uh, being addressed here because we could end up with new classes of vehicles that are very different than the ones right now. Yep. Multi-rotors and personalized transport. Yeah, so the vehicles, the aircraft, the pilots, to your point earlier, sir, you know, the, these are the ideas we want to hear about. You know, what are these you know, next generation aeronautics technologies that we need to be focused on. And, and not just right now, like think about it. next 20 years, yeah. right? So here we are talking about today and we're already thinking about electric aircraft. You think five years ago we would have been talking about electric aircraft? Probably not. No. So it's exciting. Yeah, sir, and then we're gonna go over there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I understand, you're Paul? I'm Dan. Dan, I understand that the FAA would certainly have opinions on how they spend their money. And their um, prioritization might be different federally than on the state level. Um, and certainly everybody is <coughs> aware that there's a growing shortage of pilots. Do you have any experience with Delaware State University? That mean anything to you guys? Um, I stop in there fairly regularly. I've been doing it for a number of years. And um, Delaware State University on the ramp, they had a few single and twin engineer. And now it just grew and grew. And now the runway is expanded to what it used to be a little, you know, and now it's you know like five thousand feet long, five hundred feet wide, and they are cranking out students to beat the band who are going into the airline industry. And I've spoken to them. And they're raising professions. I'm impressed with their professionalism. So wouldn't it be a benefit to the state if a school, a university like Delaware State, would have a program by which they would graduate students? It would benefit the country. The FAA might would probably like that. Judging from the amount of money they've thrown at Delaware State, um, and benefit the community as well, creating jobs, creating opportunities, creating for people to come here to learn. I mean, is that something that would be at all interesting? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Vermont Tech has an aviation program. I don't know if you know that, but they have a they have a technical uh, program that when you're done, you're a pilot, you have a private pilot's license when you're done. Um, pretty good program. And they, run it, uh, they run it out of the Williston campus, so up there, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. They run it out of the Williston campus, so they use the Burlington Airport. You know, as it's a, a good program. I, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and um, foreign carriers will be in places like Arizona and, and, and little out of the way places, and boy, they just put these guys through. They keep training and training. I mean. Not necessarily Burlington, where everybody's upset about the F-35 and all that. Um, that's a busier airport. But the smaller regional airports, like Springfield, like Bennington, like Rutland, yeah, Rutland um, wouldn't these be perfect, not, not just to have a private pilot's license, 
but, but here, here, go apply to a regional, you know, here. Yeah, so, John, I'm just next. yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think you're on the right track, and I think Vermont Tech is is doing a good job because it's it introduces them to the aeronautical industry. It's a start. It's a start, right? They introduce this is this is what it's all about. I would ask you to perhaps look at Delaware State, maybe even go down there, maybe even give your work. And we would certainly <laughs> participate, um, you know, as the owner of the infrastructure, with any college that wanted to come and approach us and say we want to put this program on your airfield, we'd be. They're doing something very exciting down there, and the federal government has been generous. No, I think you and Dan should get together and go up to Randolph and see if you can get a satellite down here in Bennington, because nobody's going to go up. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they attend. So I, I agree. I mean, something has to be done in, to get new people onto the airfields, because... Uh, benefit, obvious benefit to the country. Sure, absolutely. Now, the Williston campus is more than aeronautics, right? That's a, yeah. That's yeah. a satellite, a BTC, and, and many. They do several areas. things there. I'm not sure everything they do there, but that's. Dental hygiene. Dental hygiene, yeah. Nursing or something else up there, I think, also. So, yeah, they do several things there. It's growing, though. That program's growing. All right, switching gears here. Um, you know what this is, of course. Yes. Okay. So um, he encouraged us to have Bennington Airport development. Um, as I travel around the country, you know, a little airplane, you know, that was cool. real doctor telling the pilots. Um, most states have services that are either funded municipally or on a state level or private. There's no one size fits all. And there are crew cars, which now we have two of them. Um, they're generally staffed, and there are a number of basic services. Um, if you want to have more people coming in, first we need an instrument approach. Have we discussed that? No. No. Yet. Okay. <coughs> so millions of dollars have been spent on this nice runway. It is gorgeous. Unfortunately. Um, the, there are trees off the approach end on the west side of that worm cut and our instrument approach we had one is now gone so now people with money who fly slick airplanes are not going to come here in winter um, and there is no we used to have funding to have someone at the desk on weekends so what happened before and in the airport development I've seen it people land um, the taxi won't come for about an hour, hour and a half. There's no way to get it to time. They leave. Um, and so we're kind of back to that. Um, so without staff, without um, an instrument approach, um, so millions of dollars have been spent, and we've taken a step back. So the trees off the approach end of 1-3, need to not be there anymore, so the FAA uh, takes off the displaced thresholds. Um, uh, some kind of program, yes, we could use some help from the state, so that when people arrive on a weekend, there's somebody there. That's and common in most other airports. <laughs> Even little air, but with, with tiny, something is there. Um, and that attracts people like me, former New Yorker from the Lower East Side, and now I live here um, and involved in various business and volunteer organizations. Um, these are the things that, on a grassroots level, create sustainable economic activity that is environmentally sound. Someone comes in. And they buy a home and they create a couple of jobs or construction. That there's no pollution generated. Does that make any sense? So I'm sort of hearing two questions in there. Okay. Only two. Well, well, well. <laughs> okay, so, so <laughs> two questions that I might. Staff the airport. Yeah. Staff the airport. Okay, that's one, right? Okay. Get us an instrument approach. That's the other one. Okay. What happened to the instrument approach? Are they all dead now? 
Yeah. Okay. Because of the displaced threshold issue. Are you yes. aware of it? Yes. Yes. Very, aware, right? very aware of it. Oh, okay. Very, very aware. All right. <laughs> Which leads to... Very, very aware. That um, leads to a question that kind of bears on the subject of this meeting. Planning out into the future. All right. But as far as I know, Chris, the wheels are in the works to get the trees cut. That's correct. Yeah, so, right. so can I address his questions first? And we'll, which I might answer yours. So... Um, so we inherited that, again, we've been in the aviation program for a little over a year now and this project was already rolling, right? So when we found out that we, we literally were breaking ground and the FAA said, you have trees there, um, we've been telling you about the trees for a while, blah, blah, blah. We didn't know that, but somewhere along the line, um, someone knew. At that point, you know, we're in the construction. We don't stop the construction, right? We're in the middle of it. We gotta, we gotta finish the project. So we could either finish the project and do what we did and displace the threshold and get the airport reopened, or we just don't reopen the airport until the trees are cut. That doesn't seem like a reasonable option to anybody. Um, so we displace the threshold. There's a couple of issues with the trees. Um, there was, you know, guess what? There's bat habitat up there. I don't know if you guys knew that, but we've studied it and there's bat habitat. So there's, uh, bats are protected to a certain point a year that we can't cut trees. We're actually at that point right now, so we could actually cut the trees. Problem is, we don't have, the pro we don't have permission to go cut those trees, even though it's state property. It's, fish, state it's fish, property. And, fish and wildlife control that property. So right now we're in negotiations with fish and wildlife to be able to cut those trees. If we had 100% permission to go cut those trees, they would have been gone by now. We, we would have, we would have, the bat date came, October 1st, we would have cut them. But we, we don't have permission right now to go cut trees because Fish and Wildlife controls that property. Are those trees actually marked? We have, yes, they're surveyed. Um, I don't know that there's ribbons on every tree. <laughs> it's, it's not. <laughs> it's 12 acres. Yeah. That's a lot. 12. Yeah, so it's essentially, it's about 12 acres of property that needs to be either cut or select cut. Um, it's not clear cut. Some of it, some of it's a big area that needs to be cut and some of it's select cut. So. Let's go in order here to make sure we don't have any questions. Yeah, I, and I wanted to address one more thing on right. staffing. Number two. Number two. Sure. Um, so we're about to put out the RFP for a new FBO for Bennington. And um, I will tell you that there's different levels of FBO around the state where, um, some FBOs, um, again, have their service cars that are available. They have, they're staffed seven days a week. Um, so when we put out our FBO, F, RFP for the FBO, uh, we'll see what we get. And if there's something that that FBO is willing to do, great. Um, if we can support them in some way, great. Um, adding positions in the state of Vermont's tough. You know, we, we, we have a hard time um, adding, put it this way, we have a hard time growing government, right? Every time you, oh, we need another position, whatever. Um, that's tough to do, so. Not necessarily adding the position, but maybe throwing a few shekels at the FBO to have a part-time position or a narrow definition, fund, you know, staff, weekends, some assistance. So to accomplish that. We'll take that comment back. Um, okay. And, 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 and backing up, uh, do, you, should, do you want any of us contacting our elected representatives uh, to see if they could encourage um, uh, who, ANR? No, no, we're dealing with fish and wildlife. Fish and wildlife. Yeah, no, I don't think we need. Any encouragement? No, I don't. I think we're in good shape. I think we're fine. <laughs> All, right. All right, let's go over here and then we'll circle back. I have a question on based aircraft and if Chris can put up that slide. And those, I don't know how accurate those numbers were, Chris. Um, and yeah. if you want to send in your numbers. What is other? Where do you see that? Six. Six aircraft. Are they ultralight? Yeah. Fifth column. Where are we looking? The third to last column. Oh, so it's before military. So it's military. Must be military. Post-military. Experimental. 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 Experimental.
parachutes. And and you know, so, so this is basically, I mean, the simple solution that's probably not going to answer your question is, it's anything other than what's on the solar but I yeah. think <laughs> that's late time. That's all the The other question is, we don't know if those numbers are accurate. Do we know how many of these aircraft are certified operational flying aircraft? Okay, so the, the first question is, you know, they are accurate according to the FAA file, I mean, the official data reported for the FAA. The issue with base aircraft has always been based where? You know, if they an aircraft... could be based at one airport. You couldn't be based in Bennington and also be based in North Carolina. Yeah, so... so you, but they may be based here or not here. Right. Yeah. So I think we all, all would agree that we, we would like more flying aircraft at this airport. More flying aircraft by more fuel. So, has the state thought about how we could work on getting getting more operational aircraft at Benning? Is there any incentives to, to pilots and owners? Well, we extended the runway. <laughs> That's a <fact. laughs> Which is a big start. Um, you know, I think having, um, you know, taking the great work that um, BADC did and expanding that to now having potentially attracted a fixed based operator um, so that there will be some of these services is, is key. Um, and, you know, I think um, part of it is, you know, understanding what the needs are. Are there hangar needs? Are there, um, you know, we talked about the, um, the instrument approach. Um, what is it that, that, that pilots want to see? Why do they want to locate here? Do they want to locate here because they live near here? You know, there's, a, there's only so many things we can do to attract somebody wanting to make this their home base if they live elsewhere. The runway and, uh, the runway and taxiways are fine. The next step is the tarmac. Because to do the runway and taxiways without improving the tarmac, it, it just sends out the wrong method. It's like an unfinished thought. It's like, oh, okay, when are you going to finish? Uh, and then, again, it would raise the whole level of the place and make it more attractive. So, the apron actually is one of the things on our list, as you see, that we needed to improve. The problem is, it's not on the FAA's priority list. We've asked them if they would <coughs> help us fund the apron, and they have said no. We will continue to ask. Thank you. Getting back to my question, how does the FAA gather that information? Which information? The base the they, they do a registry. And then they reach a year? Yeah, they, it's an annual file, so they're collecting it annually. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I think, Mr. Franklin, if I'm wrong, it's self-declared, right? You get, uh, as the <coughs> pilot of your aircraft, decide where you're based. They don't look at a balance. Do they look at a balance of where you're spending more time, or is it self self reported I think yeah, it's the N number of registries that you got in that information from. Yeah, a lot of aircraft that we, we may think are based here, you know, but may be based somewhere else and vice versa. So it's not that the numbers are inaccurate because it's the official FAA data file, but it, it, it's where, you know, they're choosing to... to my, my concern would be that how many are certified and operational? And I think that would be a, a number that would be interesting you guys would be interested too, and how, how we can, what we could do to get that number up, and I don't know if there's, there's probably a trend for it to go down, but you know, how, could, how could we work on that, you know, to have, have a hangar be a hangar and not a storage bin, you know, that, that would be my point. Yeah. Good point. Kind of circling back to the trees one more time, uh, we've Answer what's going to happen to them in the immediate future, but since this plan is looking out 20 years, is there anything built into the plan or even contemplated to make sure that the trees don't creep up on us again? Right. Absolutely. Um, so up until recently, <clears throat> there has been no plan. Um, and we have this issue um, not just here in Bennington. And there's uh, airports out there that have not been cut for 20 years and that may have been just brushed 20 years ago but it's you know it's a 60 foot tree now uh, so we have this issue uh, our long-term plan is initially let's clear it and then um, I've been talking with my operations folks uh, Chris is 
key in this is we're going to have an operational plan every single year where we go and evaluate our approaches. And does that mean we clear every approach every year? No, but it means we're going to evaluate them and come up with a plan. Okay, that we're good for another two years, but next, you know, in three years, we're going to cut this whole area. And we're not going to let it get into the approach surface. And FAA has, I think that's a 10-foot buffer, I believe. Um, and if it gets even close to that 10-foot buffer, we need, to, we need to be addressing it. Um, and in certain areas, what I'd like to do is, and we can't, and again, some of this requires environmental permitting, believe it or not. If we can cut areas, I'd like to keep them brush on, because that's the cleanest, easiest, cheapest way to do it. But in certain areas, we just can't do that. It's only, we're only allowed to cut trees. We're not allowed to brush out. Up in Newport, we actually have to go, believe it or not, there's an environmental permit that says we actually have to go out and hand pick species. Oh God. I'm not kidding you. Uh, we are not allowed to go cut. Where it's, it's, so there's no one answer that fits all, but the big answer is we're gonna have a plan for each airport approach and we're gonna try to maintain them. We're not gonna let it get to where we got to this time. Um, speaking as a private citizen, not with Sierra Patrol. Uh, we do have a squadron. Uh, it's a young squadron. Um, we are um, um, uh, pretty dedicated, um, and um, we have attracted enough attention from high on up in Burlington, where they're now positioning an aircraft here um, a half a month. Um, now, if um, we can't keep the aircraft stored inside if the old air now hangar gets sold to a new individual. Um, we may not be able to store it inside. Of course, we want to do that because we're supposed to get search and rescue, we're supposed to do death rides and, and things like that. Um, it would be much appreciated uh, and good for the community if the old Van Warmer hangar Familiar with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if, if we could, if the Civil Air Patrol uh, could have a spot in that hangar, so in the event of anything or even regular exercises, the thing isn't out there on the ramp covered with snow and ice. It's uh, they won't position the plane here if it has to stay outside. Yeah. So, again, we've been working hard. Enough of us have achieved enough qualification for them to give us that airplane, and uh, it would be a step back if, um, yeah. Okay. Right? We'll take that comment back. Thank you. So there is no quick base operator here. Is that what you're Not currently. Not currently. <coughs> Not currently. That's a shame. Well, but there's a maintenance operation. <laughs> when that airport started, my father was a fixed base operator out there. There was a fixed, when did yours expire, Dave? When were, you, when were you? It hasn't been that long that we haven't had a fixed base operator. I've been in the FBO for a long time. I mean, I ran the business there, but I, I let the FBO go probably 10 years ago. Well, you were essentially running BADC. Oh, oh, BADC. Yeah. 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 yeah, we had yeah, it. We did it for a couple of years. Was that May or June? Hmm? Did it? May. May. I thought it was June. Yeah. Anyway, it's been in this summer. So, so what was the process of doing it? that out? I wanted to ask you about the second taxiway uh, to the west end of the ramp has been eliminated. And I think it's kind of silly to eliminate a taxiway. You've got one at about 1,500 feet down. If you land on runway 31, about 1,500 feet down. And if you don't make that taxiway, I guess the implication is you have to go all the way to the end of the runway and taxi back on the parallel taxiway. Since yeah, that, that second that. taxiway has been eliminated. That but if you could land at the next, or stop in the next 1,000 feet with it, which most planes can, so you're stopping to say 2,500 feet from, from the beginning of the runway. That second taxiway was quite convenient for exiting if you were landing on 3 1. Uh, so. I completely understand what you're saying, but that was eliminated uh, by, based on what the FAA told us we had to do. These are the, these are the things that um, the FAA's priority right now is to, what they're calling geometry issues, and right. how many places can access the actual runway. Um, and, right. and they're actually telling us they have, we have to eliminate. This is not the only project that we're eliminating tax. So is that the new pr procedure then, is to land on 3-1? If you don't make the first turn off, you have to go all the way to the end and, and back taxi on the parallel taxiway? Is that 
proper. You're not su suggesting that we're not allowed to do a 180 on the runway and back taxi back to the first taxiway, uh, which is probably closer. That's probably legal, the back taxi. I'm just asking, I don't know if that's a new procedure, but it seems like it's eliminated in an option for a safe landing for pilots who like to take 2,500 feet to land a single engine airplane. Well, you know, most pilots can, if they plan on it, they can stop at 1,500 feet, but not everybody stops in time. And if you don't want them doing the 180 on the runway, I mean, it just seems like you've, you've eliminated an option by deleting that taxiway. No. We've, heard, we've heard that not only at this airport, we've heard it in other places where we had to do I mean, the same thing. Many airports have four or five taxiways on the same run on the one runway, you know, and it doesn't seem to be an issue if everybody knows to hold short while another airplane's on the runway or making an approach. It seems to be logical. You just hold short. It doesn't make you know two points of access versus three points of access doesn't seem to be a big difference. Yeah, I completely understand your question. I I get it. Right. We'll take that comment back. I, I, we can talk to the FAA, but they're essentially the ones that we, we have to have all our plans reviewed by the FAA. And that was one of the comments they made that that tax rate had to come out. Hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll ask the question. We certainly will. Yeah. I'll be there again next week. Because often enough, runway 31 is the operational runway, probably, especially when the winds are strong out of the southwest, come right up past Whipstock Mountain. You know, and the winds are out of 240, you're going to land on 31, typically. So. Um, I, I'm curious as to whether the Agency of Commerce is going to be involved in these uh, meetings. You know, over the last several decades, the um, interest on the part of VTrans in terms of stimulating private business has kind of waxed and waned. There's been times when there's been no, uh, or seemingly not very much interest in, in uh, in supporting private business or recruiting them. And then there's been other times when there's been a lot of activity. But it seems like ACCV is going to take that over now. Is that, am I characterizing that correctly? I mean, they are taking the lead on the report that the legislation, legislature asked for. Um, <coughs> and they, they have been asked to um, look at the economic development around these airports and how much can it generate? Can our, air, can our airports themselves generate more economic development? Can the area around the airports generate more economic development? <clears throat> so yes, they're going to take the lead on that piece. Um, we are certainly involved because it's our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we're going to assist them any way we can. Yeah. We want our airports to grow. Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that we're talking about tonight, I, in my view, ought to rest with private enterprise. Uh, whether it's weekend staffing or whatever it is, but you know somebody, whether it's VTrans or whether it's ACCD, needs to encourage that and facilitate it. And whether it's tax breaks or uh, you know whatever sorts of incentives are available. So these types of comments that you're making about this, we are going to actually bring them to ACCD. So this, what you just said, will be in our notes, and we're going to bring that to them. Tell Mike to. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and just to be and just to be clear, so I didn't want to bombard you guys with legalese that they do, and you know when they're drafting legislate, <clears throat> legislation. But all of this stuff, even though it says the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, there's a comma after, and it says in conjunction with the Agency of Transportation. There's two core pieces. There's the infrastructure, and then there's the business side, and sometimes. You know, the line is, is a little everywhere depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So we're, we're definitely going to bring that back with us. Um, and they're going to be doing outreach, you know, themselves. This isn't, you know, the only meeting we're going to have on this topic or that the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, you know, will have. That there will definitely be more. The, the point is always we're, we're really early in this process by design. We want to hear these ideas before we start putting plans together. You know, otherwise we got to redo everything and, and just spend a lot of time for nothing. This is the early point that we're seeking your input so we can start formalizing these ideas that you're mentioning. I just want to mention that um, the good news and the bad news is that Secretary Sherling of the Agency of Commerce um, has been very personally involved in, in that legislation in working with us on this um, outreach process. He had originally planned to be at most all of these meetings, but um, 
that chain plan had to change as of late last week. Um, but he's a pilot, um, which is great. Um, he understands the needs of the aviation community and the interests, and um, he, he's taking this very personally. Um, it's just hard sometimes when you have somebody like the secretary trying to to to, so to carry the water on some of this. So um, I know that he will be anxious to learn about what your feedback was and um, work as we continue to uh, find ways to integrate this um, on both sides of, um, of the house because it, it's going to take not just the agency of transportation as we've talked about to initiate making <coughs> many of these happen including the agency of education and, and uh, the department of labor and other forces are going to have to come together around some of these topics yeah and just to reiterate the point earlier about the public-private partnership legislation that passed um, in the legislature last year. We view that as really important legislation because what it effectively allows is private, more direct private participation uh, in transportation facilities and to the extent that we can somehow um, you know, navigate that into federal funding mm -hmm. will make it a lot easier for experimental technologies for education. That's what we're really seeking with this public-private partnership legislation is you've heard about it federally. You know, there's been, it's been in the national conversation. Um, if, if they decide to make dollars available, uh, we already have our own state legislation in place to be able uh, to benefit from something like that. So we're monitoring, you know, a, a big part of the funding piece to be able to accomplish a lot of what we're, we're hearing here tonight. Yep. Could you put up that slide that had the uh, next projects that um, the Bennington Airport could uh, benefit from? I think you had a fuel farm. This one? Yeah, there, there's, uh, you know, this isn't a comprehensive list by any way. This, this, is, this is actually why we're here. We want to hear from you guys. Right. Because, yeah. well, there's, there's some minor things, I mean, really minor things at the airport <laughs> right now, like the fence, you know, right when you go into the, uh, onto the apron, you know, when you're driving your car on the left on the uh, west side that's been snagged by a front loader or whatever. Part you know, of missing. Uh, probably a year ago, you know, bent posts and everything. And then um, the side of the terminal building facing south, uh, you know, the, uh, it's deteriorating. It's Tired. coming apart. Um, the building facade? The building, the yeah, exterior, exterior. The concrete yeah. blocks, the uh, mortar between the blocks paint, you know, whatnot has fallen off. So, um, <coughs> it speaks how, for the how, yeah, it's just a bad entrance to the airport. Uh, we also had put together at the request of the uh, state, um, as I recall in the past, the potential of moving the, the entrance gate, you know, uh, this is identified things, uh, further towards the north so there could be a seating area so people could come in and make it more friendly. Because right now it looks like uh, the entrance to the prison, you know. Uh, so if there were picnic tables there, the people could come and sit. We see a lot of people pulling their cars up to the airport, and they're just sitting in their cars, looking across the fence towards the aircraft operations. You know, people of all ages just sitting there and trying to enjoy the airport, but it's it just doesn't present a welcoming image right now. That's a, that's a good point, and although we're taking notes, you know, I go back to these common forms, very important for, for folks to fill them out and make sure we get them, uh -huh. because we're going to be compiling all this stuff at all the nine different meeting locations. Sir? Is there a history of the state selling the airport to the private sector? Is this something that's happened in the past and might happen in the future? Do you have a buyer? <laughs> <laughs> How much you want for it? <laughs> so I, you know, I think the answer there's, you know, contact Danny. There's, you know, there's an initiative that, that, that you're considering. I mean, is there history on the path? I, I know that they pick up airports. Yeah. They, they purchase the airports, but is there a history of it going the other way? So the reason we purchased the airports was because a lot of the municipalities were letting them go, right? They, they didn't want them. And the state, well, we've done that across the modes. We've, we've bought railroads, we've bought airports, and just to maintain the infrastructure. Uh, you know, certainly, if there was an economic development initiative out there that um, 
you know, that was presented to us. We're going to evaluate it. We're going to evaluate it. I, I would also mention that um, from time to time, the legislature has the idea that the state will need 10 airports, um, maybe not it may not be the most effective use of, of public dollars. Um, I think some legislators um, have the impression that they were operating, you know, private clubs for the well wealthy who have air, airplanes. And, and, and I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to tell you what the reality is sometimes of what I hear when I'm at the legislature and how important it is, I, and this goes back to the education and the future needs for pilots, and you know, this is a mode of transportation, all of the civil air patrol things that happen. Um, there's a whole host of things, and so we spend a lot of time talking about the whole host of things that occur at state airports, including cargo movements and passenger movements and, and the other activities we've talked about tonight. Um, but I think it's always a bit of a risk, and, um, and so having an active and involved community of constituents that can help explain the story of, of why airports are important is, is critical. And in terms of the future, you know, we'll, I think Dan makes a good point that, you know, we have um, from time to time have been approached by private entities who might be interested in airports. One of the biggest um, things we have to address is the FAA investments that are made in these airports. Uh, there's a sort of period of time where there's a payback requirement. Um, so, um, you know, they're, they're not, um, it's not as though we can just hand over, hand over a turnkey operation um, without um, sort of um, taking into account the public investment that's already been made. So it's, it's very complicated. What are your projected funding trends going forward? And are you going to be asking for more money? Is you going to accept loan funding? So I can answer the federal part of that. I'll leave the state <coughs> funding to, to Dan. So on the federal level, there's a five-year reauthorization bill that was agreed to just you know a couple of days ago, uh, and that provides a little beyond level funding in the sense that for five years, the, the major source of funding for aviation projects is the Airport Improvement Program, the AIP. That has been level funded for the next five years. Um, and then there's a new provision in that authorization bill that provides a little additional money beyond that. And I say a little bit because it's not clear what the rules around that money is. So the program is essentially level funded with the possibility of the occasional, you know, bonus discretionary funding that may come our way with no certainties. That's the federal piece. At the state level. Well, at the state level, it's very general. Um, nobody, you know, nobody wants additional fees. Nobody wants additional taxes. Um, I'm honor. I don't. Um, so we have to work with what we have. Um, if it's hard for me to say that our funding is exactly going to be level funded, it's going to go up a certain amount of percent, it's going to go down a certain percent, because <clears throat> as we do our <clears throat> our capital improvement plan that we present to the FAA every year, we propose a whole bunch of projects, and if they meet their priorities and our projects line up. Some years we get additional discretionary funding. So if we can get additional federal discretionary funding, we have to provide the state match. So in that case, we have to go and make the make the case that we want additional state money. To, if we put up 10%, we're going to get 90% of this project. And a lot of times uh, we're successful in our argument to do that. So it's hard for me to say it's going to what, what it's going to do because it's really based on. Um, FAA's priorities and the discretionary grants that we get because we have to manage them. Yeah, and that's an interesting point. And so how these projects actually get funded? If you look at the aviation, it, it's almost like a stock, it, it can go up, it can fluctuate from year to year depending on the FAA priorities. So this is uh, not 
uncommon. You, you know, our highway funding is actually allocated the same way. There's just a lot more highway dollars, but there, there's a certain amount that has to be spent on safety, a certain amount on interstates, a certain, so there's all these different buckets. But we have more discretion on the highway side on how we're gonna spend those dollars than exist on the aviation side. The aviation side is a, is a prioritization system where the dominant criteria are the FAA priorities. That, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> so from their perspective, you know, we, we may need um, hangers and we may need um, you know, maintenance, we may need ILS approaches, you know, but they, they may be zoomed in on something completely different. Which is what they are right now. They're zoomed in on geometry issues. They, they're not zoomed in on the other stuff. And we geometry. Have other so how do you access that runway? We, we don't want 10 taxiways coming into that. Okay. Right. That's, yes. And there's a lot of airports across the country, Burlington is one of them, that have significant geometry issues, and they're the ones that are getting the funding right now. Right, but we only had two taxiways, and now we only still only have two taxiways, but they've been moved. The taxiway is right in that picture there that has been eliminated. <clears throat> right. And you and they're saying right now that you can't you can't make one move onto the airport off the apron. You have to actually come off the runway. You have to actually make a 90 degree turn before you get on. So you can't go directly. On. Yeah, but that that's our big challenge on the federal front, and that impacts the state dollars that go into the program. Is you know we're really at the whim at whatever those federal priorities are. Is the reason for that safety? I'm sorry. Is the reason for that safety? Mm -hmm. It, well, safety is safety is always the buzzword that everybody uses. But there's different. What they they, differ, they prioritize their safety on different things it, it, that keeps changing. Like a couple of years ago, their big um, safety buzzword was uh, safety areas. So the ends of the runways, right? When you run off the end of the runway, is that a safety area? Are you are you meeting the FAA requirements for safety areas? They weren't even looking at geometry issues. Now they're, looking, now they're not looking at the safety areas, they're looking at the geometry issues. I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years. They tell us. And it, it could be that we either, either have a lot of projects or we don't, depending on what those, those priorities are. Sir? Yep. I just uh, had a follow up on the very main, uh, minor maintenance issues you know, that, I, that I brought up, like repairing the fence. Can we just call somebody at the uh, district run? District One garage and have them come over and write the uh, fence posts, you know, at the airport there. And yeah, I'll, I'll talk to Chris. About or, that. I mean, that seems fairly minor. Provide <clears throat> drainage. The fence posts have been dragged over by a front motor. Um, or is that something that we should try to do with a four wheeler and try to <laughs> pull the uh, posts back and then put we'll, them? We'll figure that one. That one seems fairly minor. Well, that's what I'm saying. It is very minor. And then those, the, those do add up. You know, the, you mentioned the terminal front. You know, there's lots of projects on the list, and prioritizing them is challenging with the amount terminal of Terminal front is that way because you have a water issue. Mm -hmm. you got to fix the water <coughs> issue before you fix it. Oh, off the roof? Yes. So it's a roof issue. Oh, okay. Well, again, write the comments down. We really don't okay. Know. We'll do it. You know, it seems to the point earlier about you know pilots being notified. There, there's quite a few pilots in here. You know, please, uh, the link to our website has a list of every public meeting that we're going to have, every location. Please forward that, you know, to your colleagues or to your colleagues. I think my issue was the public. The pilot, we all figured it out.